super, super excited tonight. I know in the midst of a little snowstorm that you're all here to welcome this amazing One Book, One Light and author, Sharon Cameron, the author of The Light in Hidden Places, this book right here. I'm just going to speak anecdotally that this book has been incredibly popular here at West Leiden. Hundreds of kids have been reading it, um, coming to me and saying, what, can I have another one just like it? So it, is, it has been a home run, and I'm so pleased to spend the day with you today. I've enjoyed every minute. So without further ado, here is our introduction. Sharon Cameron is the number one New York Times bestselling author of The Dark Unwinding, A Spark Unseen, Rook, The Forgetting and the Knowing, The Light in Hidden Places, and Bluebird, all from Scholastic Press. Her books have won the Parents' Choice Gold Award, the Westchester Fiction. Witherspoon Book Club pick and has sold in 18 foreign countries. And when she's not writing, she can be found shooting her longbow. Yes, okay. Thumbing through dusty, I'm just going to say books. I don't, I get, tomes? Okay, tomes. <laughs> Pondering the past or continuing her lifelong search for secret passages. She lives with her family in Nashville, Tennessee, and she is just amazing. You are going to enjoy your time with her, Sharon Cameron. I think I've just consistently had the best intros ever. Um, and so I'll have to come back to Chicago more often. Um, you guys make me feel great. Thank you so much um, for having me. And thank you so much for coming out um, on a snowy evening um, to hear me talk about what is a incredibly uh, special project uh, for me to have worked on, and that is The Light in Hidden Places. So I'll just tell you um, a, a little bit about me before I get started. Um, I do consider myself to be quite an accidental writer. Um, it was an accident I worked really hard to accomplish <laughs> at some point, um, but I was not one of those kids who you know, always dreamed about being a writer or kept a journal. I wrote not one unassigned word in my, in my youth, um, but I was always a reader. Um, I have always been a huge reader. Story has shaped me all of my life, I think in ways that I didn't even realize at the time. But I spent uh, the first 22, 23 years of my career being a classical pianist. I was a musician for many years because um, everybody in Nashville is a classical pianist. That's what we're known for is the classics. And uh, so, of course, that's what I decided to do. And, and I loved my life as a musician, actually. Um, I was very happy. I thought I would do that forever until I got a little bit obsessed with a very obscure piece of history. This was actually a piece of Scottish history that, and when I say obsessed, I mean obsessed like this was pre-internet days. So in her library loan and I were the best of friends. I had them, you know, sending me manuscripts and books. Um, I traveled to Scotland and I met the descendants and I talked with them and went to the places and one fateful day, I walked past my computer with 45 free minutes to spare. And I thought, huh, I wonder what that would be like. What would it be like to write a first chapter about this piece of history that has so captured my imagination? And so I sat down, and for the first time, I wrote. And I don't know if you believe in love at first sight, but that's a little bit what happened to me. I got up from my computer 45 minutes later and without exaggeration, decided to completely change my life. And I did. 
I started writing every day. I found professional organizations. I found a critique group, which are still some of my dearest friends on the planet. Um, I started um, learning the business as well as honing the craft. Four years later, I had a novel. Um, a couple of years after that, I had an agent. Um, and then I sold my first book, which was not the book, the Scottish book that I wrote, um, the four-year novel. Um, it was actually something completely different. Um, but I sold that book to Scholastic, and that came out in 2012. And I have been with the same editor and the same publishing company ever since. So here I am, seven books later, still slightly surprised about it, honestly. When I look back on my life, I still think, wow, um, how did I end up here? Um, but it is an incredible lesson turn in my life, um, one that I couldn't have anticipated, but now one that I would have, I, I don't know what my life would be without the words and the stories. So to tell you about Light in Hidden Places, I'm going to take you back um, to those years when I was busy being a musician, um, having happy life and uh, not expecting anything unexpected, I guess, to happen to me when one day in the early 90s, I walked through my living room. I did. I made another little small decision, kind of like deciding to sit down in front of the computer one day. I turned on my TV and I had no idea that that day was going to completely change a direction of my life because on my television, there was this woman, and she said five words. She said, my name is Stefania Podgorska. And so I sat down and I started listening as this woman described her life. And she talked about being a young, 13-year-old Polish Catholic girl. Come on, slides. Ooh, can you believe it stopped? And I was doing so good. I'll just give you a nod. <laughs> this has been very finicky today. <laughs> she described being a young 13-year-old Polish Catholic girl who grew up on a farm with lots of brothers and sisters in a very tiny little backwater village um, and Stefania was not into the farm um, or lots of siblings. Um, she wanted action. She wanted lights. She was, she was a very energetic, busy person. And at the age of 13, she convinced her mother to allow her to move to the big city of Chemish, Poland. And there you can see Shemesh is at the bottom, and that is how you pronounce the name. I know it's not, um, not uh, intuitive um, that that's how you would say that. And this is a pre-war map. Um, it's interesting to be showing you this map today um, with the events of today. You can see Ukraine um, is actually now the border runs right there within about five miles of Shemesh. And from the hills, you can actually see right into Ukraine. Um, but back in Stefania's day, Shemesh was the big city. It's not a big city. It's a tiny little place. But it was big to her. And when she got to Shemesh, she got a job working in a little grocery store for the Diamant family. This is some members of the Diamant family. They were a Jewish family that owned a little grocery, the kind of place where you'd buy apples and newspapers and a little bit of bread, almost like a convenience store, really. And, you know, it was an unusual, it was an unusual arrangement um, for, uh, to have a, a Catholic girl working for a Jewish family. Um, that didn't happen all that often in Shemesh. Um, it was uh, the, the two groups, while they did business together, um, socially they didn't mix very often. Um, but this is what happened. She ended up working for this family. And she told a story as I was sitting there 
on my couch. She told the story of the Diamant's four sons. They had a daughter who was living actually um, in another part of the of the Poland. Um, this is the second son, Max, and he is in front of the grocery store here. Um, she told the story of these boys and how they would tease her and how she really became almost like part of their family. And it hadn't really occurred to her, I think, the difference between the two families until she went to the market one day. Mrs. Diamant sent her out on an errand. And while she was in the square, a fight broke out between two young boys, about 10 years old. And they were hitting each other in the street and a crowd gathered. And the fight had started because one boy called the other a dirty Jew. And the crowd around got, got into and took up those words. It's a dirty Jew, dirty Jew. And Stefania left the market and she went back to the little grocery store and she locked herself in the bathroom. And I, you know, and I'm sitting on my couch watching her describe the story. And she, she described looking in the mirror and touching the skin of her face, running her hand along the skin of her arm. And she said, then that's when she made the decision that her skin was just skin that Jewish skin was just skin, that there was no difference between Jewish and Catholic skin. And so Stefania stayed with the Diamant. She moved into their house. She lived as a sister until 1939 when Hitler invaded Poland and tanks rolled into Shemesh bombs dropped on Shemesh. Um, the Russians and the Germans fought each other in Shemesh. So um, as, they, as that battle line went back and forth, the city ended up dividing. So the demarcation line between the German lines and the Russian ran through the river, which ran through the city. So half of Shemesh became German, and the other half became Russian. And um, that situation lasted for maybe oh, 18 months. The Diamants and Stefania were lucky enough to be on the Russian side because the Russians were not persecuting the Jews. But then, of course, the Germans pushed through. The Jews were rounded up in the Russian half of Shemesh as the Germans took over, and they were put into ghettos this is the last synagogue in Shemesh burning. This is one of the last pictures of that invasion. And so Stefania was left alone. The Diamant family was sent to the ghetto and eventually to concentration camps. On the top right, this is Mr. and Mrs. Diamant, Isaac and Leah. This is Chaim on the bottom, that's Ernestina their daughter in the middle, and that is Ishu on the bottom left. The top two are um, actually the in-laws, so it's a different part of the family. The dates underneath are the year that they died. But in the meantime, Stefania was trying to keep them from starving. She was sneaking into the ghetto. She was doing everything she could but Stefania was 16 years old. She had no job. She had no money. She was in a Nazi-occupied city. And then she discovered that not only had the Diamonds been rounded up and taken, but that her own mother and one of her brothers had also been taken by the Germans as slave labor and taken back to Germany. And that left her little sister, Helena, alone so Stefania walked about 30 miles back to her home farm, and she got her sister, and she brought her back to Shemesh. And so now we have a 16-year-old 
a six-year-old, alone, on their own, no family, no one to care for them. And that is when there came a knock on the door. And on the other side of the door was Max Diamant, the second son. This is his uh, German identification papers, identifying him as a Jew. You can see the Nazi eagle on the bottom. And Max, on the other side of the door, was broken, and he was bloody because he had just jumped from a moving train taking him to a death camp. He knew what was going to happen when he got there, and he and his brother decided to commit suicide, and they got the other um, passengers in the train to shove them up and through the high window to try and jump, and his brother didn't jump. He ended up jumping alone. His brother never came, and he didn't die. He had bread stuffed down the front of his shirt, and he hit a fence post on the bread, which probably saved his life. And he had nowhere to go. So he went to the one person he knew in Chemish, and that was Stefania Pitgorska. And he said, please hide me. And so now Stefania and Helena, this is a picture of them taken during the war. They have a decision to make because they knew what happened to people that hide Jews. The family down the street two weeks earlier, oh, actually that wasn't for you, I'm sorry, I was just, <laughs> I was just moving. I'll give you a clearer, clearer motion next time. The family just down the street um, two weeks earlier had been shot because they had found Jews hiding in their house. And that was the entire family, the children included. And Stefania saw that, she wrote about it in her memoir. She knew the consequences. And Stefania and Helena decided to hide Max. And then, not only did they hide Max, they hid Max's brother and his brother's fiance. And then more came, and Stefania had to find another place. She found a house on Tatarska Street that had an attic where they could build a false wall. And by the time they got that false wall built, there were 13 Jews hiding in Stefania Pedgorska's attic, living on the ration cards of two little girls and whatever Stefania could make at a job in a German tool factory that she had gotten. And it was a desperate, horrific situation, having all of these people that had to be silent all the time, could never go outside, no one could ever come to the house. You, no one could see you buying enough food to feed all of these people. She would walk for miles to hide the fact of how much food she was bringing into the house so no one would suspect her. And in the middle of this, there came another knock on the door. And this time, there were two SS officers on the other side of the door. And they said, you have two hours to leave. We are requisitioning this house as staff quarters for the new German hospital that's going in across the street. And Stefania had another choice to make. And the 13 hidden in the attic said, you have to go. You've done enough, you've done all you can do. Take your sister and run. And Stefania and Helena said, no, we won't leave you. We will not do it. And the SS officers came back, and Stefania and Helena were still there. And they said, oh, well, actually, we only need one room. We've only got two nurses left, so we only need one room. You can stay in this room, and we will take this bedroom. And so the Nazis moved in. Two nurses, 
and they brought along their SS officer boyfriends. And they moved into the bedroom that was directly below the attic where 13 Jews were hiding. I was sitting on my couch listening to this amazing woman tell the story and I was riveted. I couldn't move. What she was telling me, what happened next, was one of the most incredible stories of self-sacrifice, of bravery, of humanity, and love I had ever, ever heard. Stefania Podgorska became my hero that day. I wanted to believe that if I was put to the test, I could do even a little of what she was able to accomplish at the age of 16 and 17. I wanted to live my life believing that maybe I could do that. And I never forgot her story. I didn't forget her story for 23 years. So fast forward, now it's years later, I've made my left turn in life. I have five published books out. I have tools I didn't have before, like Google. <laughs> and I decided, you know what? I'm going to find out what happened to Stefania Podgorska. I'm going to find Stefania Podgorska. And so I searched, and I found her. And I found the end of her story. And that was that she married the first man she saved, Max Diamant, who jumped off the train. And they had a son. They changed their name to Bursminski, and they had a son, Ed Bursminski. And so I reached out to Ed, <laughs> rather tentatively, um, and said, hi, I'm an author. I really like your mom. <laughs> um, I'd really like uh, you know, to talk with you about your mom's story and the possibility um, if you would allow me to write about her. And Ed was incredibly uh, open um, and kind to a stranger that contacted him. And um, I went out to Los Angeles and met with him. And he shared his mom's pictures, her stories, her memories, photographs, her memoir. Um, it was just an incredible wealth of information. And he said, do you want to come meet my mom? And I said, yes, yes, I want to come meet your mom. How often does it happen in life that we get to sit at the feet of one of our heroes? Never, but it happened to me. Stefania Podgorska was, she had dementia at the time, and she was in the very last months of her life. She doesn't know she met me. I will never forget meeting her. And after we left, um, <laughs> I ended up going <laughs> to a Target with Ed and picking out some pajamas for her. And I thought, what is life <laughs> that I have uh, ended up uh, buying Stefania Pagorska's pajamas? Uh, you just never know <laughs> what's going to happen next, I guess. Um, Stefania passed away as I was working on the book, and I was privileged enough to help write her obituary. I got to speak at her funeral. And three weeks after her funeral, Ed and my husband and I, we all got on a plane, and we went to Poland to rediscover her life. This is Shemish, as it looks today. Um, it's really quite a beautiful little town, lots of cathedrals. But we walked those streets, you know, where Stefania walked. Um, we looked for the site of the tool factory. We um, went down to the archives and looked at maps and pictures. We found um, the addresses and went to the apartment where the Diamonts lived. Um, 
we searched and searched for the grocery store. Um, there's been a lot of bombing and a lot of changing. We think we found it, but we couldn't ever be quite sure about that. Um, we went to Tatarska Street. Um, this is the front of Tatarska. Um, the other side shows the back side, and that is where Stefania lived um, with the 13. And if you see the two small windows at the top, the dark one on the right, that is the window that looked out on the, um, looked into the hidden area of the attic where the 13 were hidden. This is Stefania standing in the attic in the 1980s. Um, and that is Ed in the very background. If you look just beyond Ed, the cameraman there, you'll see a sort of vertical line up the wall. That is where the false wall went across and made the attic look shorter than it actually was. This is a view into that space. This is not enough room for 13 people. It's not, the ceiling is not tall enough to stand in, really even on the tall end. In order to stay in this space, they all had to lay down on the one side, kind of stacked in like sardines. If someone needed to turn over, everyone had to turn over. That's how tightly packed they were, and they had to remain absolutely silent. Not a sneeze, not a cough, not a snore, no movement, absolutely silent. We went to the ghetto of Shemesh. This is, this is where the sort of the front gate of the Shemesh ghetto was. Um, there would have been concrete barricades across this street. This is where Helena, at the age of six, bit the leg of an SS officer who caught her passing notes to Max. It's a moment she's very proud of, by the way. This is the building where the Diamonts were housed when they were in the ghetto. If you look at this little window, basement window, um, that is the window where Max um, witnessed SS officers killing babies. This is an area of the ghetto that is now a memorial. This is the wall where 1,500 men, women, and children, mostly women and children, um, were shot when they would not fit on the trains. And we even drove way out into the country. This is the curve in the railroad tracks. That's Ed walking the curve in the railroad tracks where his father jumped from a moving train. And we visited with some of the survivors. This is Stefania on the right. On the left, that is Jusha in the book. She was um, the little girl that was in the attic, Jusha Schillinger. We went to her home in Belgium, and she described what it was like to be a child in the attic, what it felt like to have to remain so still, to know that there were so many people who wanted to kill you as a child, she described what it felt like to have to lie still while rats ran back and forth across her body. And we went to visit Helena. Um, Helena remained in Poland, she became a doctor, and she was very gracious. She invited us into her home and shared her memories that was very, very difficult for her to do that. Um, and as you can see, she put out the most incredible spread you can possibly imagine. And that is her homemade, that is her homemade wine on the table, and that packs quite a punch. Let me just, <laughs> let me say. But uh, she was um, so gracious, and she looked me in the face, and she said to me, "I did." what I did because it was the right thing to do. And she holds to that. Remember when I said, it never happens that you get to sit at the feet of one of your heroes? It's happened to me twice. So I left Poland and I started writing the book that would become The Light in Hidden Places on the plane on the way home. 
but it was not the book that I thought I was going to write. I went to Poland thinking, you know, I, I want to share with the world what my heroes, Stefania Podgorska and her sister Helena did. I want everyone to know the incredible sacrifices and bravery of these two amazing people. I'm a student of history. I think I said that story shaped me. You know, I, history is the story of our world. And I think a lot about the connections between our past and our present and our future. And while I would never consider myself to be an expert on any one area of history, it is something that I look at long and hard and all the time. I knew what happened in the camps. I understood what came together to create World War II. I had looked at Hitler long before Light in Hidden Places. I had looked at Hitler very closely. I read his speeches. I watched films. I watched his propaganda. I looked at all of his propaganda stuff, you know, at, his, at the films of him practicing his speeches, the psychology of this man. Even before Stefania Podgorska, listening to the oral histories and the memories of survivors of the Holocaust is something I had spent hours on. I knew. When I went to Auschwitz and went on the tour that they take tourists on in Auschwitz, Part of that tour, they take you to the changing rooms where people would be asked to strip down and then ask you to walk through into the shower room, which is the gas chamber. And there you stand in silence for four to five minutes, just standing about the time the length of time it would take someone to die. It is dark and dank, and the walls are concrete and stained, and frankly, it stinks, and I think it will always stink in that room. It is the worst place I have ever stood. And I walked out, I got to walk out, I walked out of that room and I realized that I knew nothing about the Holocaust. I had lots of facts in my head, but facts are not good enough. I might have known about the Holocaust, but I had not felt it, not the way that I really needed to. And so I realized on the plane, I don't want to share the knowledge of what this wonderful woman did during the Holocaust. I want people to feel this one young woman's experience during the Holocaust. I want them to walk with her each step, each decision that got harder than the last. Because facts will fade. We learn lots of facts in school. We'll retain some of them. A lot of them will be gone. Feelings we do not forget. If we feel it, we're not going to forget it. And this, we cannot forget it. We have to feel it. And that's why I think books like Light in Hidden Places, and there are lots of other books like this, I think that's why they're so important. That's why historical fiction is so important. We are built to respond to story. Story helps us feel. Story creates that empathy. We have to feel it. 
And that is where the change has to start. These two girls made a choice. They chose humanity over hate, and they chose to stand up against that hate. But what I want to say to you tonight is that the choice that they made, the real choice was not to hide 13 Jews in an attic. The real choice happened years before when Stefania Podgorska looked in a mirror and decided that her skin was only skin. That was the choice that prepared her to make the next and the next until she was ready to make that bigger choice. That small choice like me sitting down in front of a computer one day or randomly turning on my television, that small, seemingly insignificant choice. Her choice changed the world. It changed everything. It changed the lives of 13 people and the children and the grandchildren that now walk the earth because of what she did it changed me, and here I am telling her story. It changes the world. Her small choice is still changing the world. And if the choice of a young, uneducated, 16-year-old girl from a backwater village in Poland, someone that no one would look at and say, oh, aren't you an important person? If the choice of that young girl can change the world, then don't our choices, we who are just ordinary people, living our ordinary lives, taking care of our ordinary business, don't our choices have that same potential? I say they do but they don't start big, they start small. Those small choices matter, they change everything. And that is why I think that, I, I hesitate to say this book, because I may have written a book, but this is really about a life that was lived. And this life that was, that was lived is not really a story about history or a different time from ours because the hate that created the Holocaust we all know is alive and well and thriving in our world. This is a story about now. This is a challenge to now. What are we going to do in our lives to make a choice and stand up against hate right now? That's what Stefania and Helena mean to me. And I hope that her story in the form of this book will help continue that process for, for as long as possible. So thank you so much for listening to me. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, very, very much. Yes. I know that there might be some questions in the audience, so just feel free to shout out a question if you have one. I should have told you I was going to do that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, sir, please. Hey, I was wondering if you could reflect on something you, you were mentioning. I'm a proud son and nephew of a father and uncle who served in World War II from Africa all the way up to uh, Berlin. Uh, My I grandfather was in Africa as well. He yeah. spoke four languages. and something that affected him throughout his whole life after he came home from the war. He was one of the first soldiers to liberate a concentration camp in Poland. 
And even months after the war was over, he was still there interpreting the languages of the prisoners, documents, etc., etc. I have pictures at home dated November 1945, and you can see those long barracks that these people were housed in. Yes. Celebrating whatever Thanksgiving meal they could get at that time. It haunted all his, all his life. And when I was stationed at Great Lakes on the weekend, I would spend some time at my uncle's house and my grandmother's. And as I was trying to sleep on the couch, because I was the only place I could sleep, my uncle would stay on the little couch, and he would talk about his experience at these concentration camps that he was at. And like you, I was never taught about the Holocaust or very little of anything about World War II going to school. Mm -hmm. I don't even recall even getting any education on that. But I didn't realize that at that time that I was getting, I was getting a living history of what was going on. Mm -hmm. and, and before he died, he had to go back to Poland for closure, I'm, I'm assuming. He had to go back there. And not too long afterwards, he passed away. So I, I tell a lot of young folks there, that young kids, students, that sometimes you just get bored talking, you know, when your grandparents or grandparents talk to you about their life experience. You really got to listen to them. Because I wish my father, grandfather, and uncle were still alive, because I got a million questions to ask that I can't ask them. So if they're alive and they're talking about their life experience, you got to ask a million questions. I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more, and I think it's amazing actually that he did talk to you about it because so many did not. You know, it was much more usual I think for um, people to be very stoic, you know, in those days and to move on. Um, so I think it's amazing that that he did. I think oral histories are so important. Um, they've certainly been um, important to me because they give you such a broad perspective, not a history book perspective, not the perspective of presidents and kings, but you know the perspective of just the normal people on the ground. And um, I think any time that you can record your relatives, um, it's such a valuable thing to do. And anyone who wants to listen to Stefania Podgorska tell her story, you can watch the same thing I watched. Um, I've gone back and realized it was Holocaust Remembrance Week that day I turned on my TV, and that's why I was seeing her. Um, the United States Holocaust Memorial and Museum website, um, you can view and listen, see videos of the oral history projects that they have been doing since the 80s. Stefania is on there. Max is on there. Um, he's, uh, he's under his name that he changed to, Joseph Brzezminski. And it's Stefania Podgorska Brzezminski um, on there. But you can go and listen to these and, and myriad others tell their stories. And I can't encourage you enough to do that. It's, it's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I do think that um, I, I love reading. I, it's obvious that there's nothing like Diary of Anne Frank. I love, I love reading the stories of survivors, but I think it's also important to focus, you know, on the, the history that we can know about those who were able to do something 
um, you know, those who were able to stand up. And there are so many hundreds, like Stefania Pekorska, that we will never know their names because they were not as fortunate as her. But that does not mean that they were any less heroic. And so some, some of this book is in honor of them as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, I did tease you with my Scottish novel, didn't I? I am going back to that Scottish novel. One of these days, I am, go I am going to do it. I'll answer, I'll answer the easy one first. Um, the, the Scottish novel was about what happened to, with one particular family in the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. And it was actually the Cameron family. It was the chief of Clan Cameron who committed treason um, by, you know, trying to put Bonnie Prince Charlie on the throne. And it was one of the most profound lose-lose situations probably ever. And um, I got into that story because I had been researching my husband's family history. We hit a brick wall and I thought, oh, I'll just go look at other Camerons. Um, it turned out that I found out later, much later through DNA after I had already written the book, that he was actually directly related um, to all the people in the book and that one of the massacre scenes that I wrote about was about his family, actually. So it's still a very, um, it is what led me into writing, so it made me feel like I'm doing the right thing, you know? Um, and I will go back, it's such a special, it's such a special story to me, I'm so glad that that wasn't published because I was learning then, and I could, I could do it so differently now. And so that's definitely in my future, because that's also a special story to me. Um, as, far as, the, as far as the research um, for this book, um, I was very lucky to have Ed Bersminski, who speaks fluent Polish, and who was my door. Um, to Helena, who was my door, to Jusha, who goes by Christina now, um, he really opened uh, all of those doors uh, for me. And so I owe him an enormous debt of gratitude at the same time that he handed me such a gift of trust um, in, in handling his mother's story. Um, so that part was actually weirdly easy, um, but that's because I had Ed. As far as um, the actual research for the novel as a whole, um, the backbone of the novel comes from Stefania's oral histories, all the oral histories that I collected while I was there, as well as Stefania's unpublished memoirs that she wrote um, throughout um, the 80s. Um, and there's, those are typewritten in um, very interesting versions of, of English. I think English might have been her third or fourth language. Um, but wow. What an incredible voice and personality was behind those words. Sometimes it was a little hard to tell what was going on or when it was happening. It wasn't structured in a very, you know, in, in a way that always made sense. But wow, you could so pull the, a sense of her personality from that. But on top of that, I had to do some very intensive research on the history of Shemesh itself and the history of the war in Poland. Um, one of the things that I used is um, Shemesh, uh, the Jewish community's um, book of memory um, from Poland that had all the dates um, for when um, particularly um, the deportations happened for the Jews or what dates things happened to certain families. Um, I was able to read the diaries of Renia Spiegel, who was a um, Polish uh, Jewish teenager in um, Shemesh at the time and who kept a diary. Um, I was able to read that. And so what I did, um, just on top of all the basic dates, 
you know, of the war as I created an enormous timeline. A time, the timeline of everything, <laughs> um, so that I would be aware of what was happening in Europe, what was happening in Poland, what was happening in Russia, what was happening in America, you know, what all, all of these things and how that affected when the planes were flying over Shemesh and when the bombs were falling and, and things like that. So, so basically I had to take all those sources and combine them into a calendar almost um, to then take her story and make sure it was fitting into the right place. So she didn't always say, and two days later, or on May 15th, you know, she wasn't telling me things like, things like that. So, so yeah, so that's, that was basically how I organized it. Um, but Light in Hidden Places is, it is a novel. Um, everything that happened in that memoir could not go into a book. I would have written a thousand pages, you'd all still be reading. If I had put everything that happened in, it would also be almost unbelievable. They should have been caught so many times. It's almost just unbelievable. Um, so I had to be very selective, I had to pick and choose. Everything that is in the book happened. So the things that are in the book, that is the way they happened. There were three places, there was a character that I combined, there were two people that I combined into one character, there was a little um, truncating of a timeline, and there was one incident that were more from my imagination, and I put those in the author's note. So I really wanted everyone to understand what's real and what isn't. This is one of those situations where it's hard to tell where fiction and nonfiction begin and end. This is fiction because nobody can know the exact words that were said here. Nobody can know, you know exactly how this relationship started. We just know it started. So things like that, that's where I had to bring my imagination in. But I tried to do that in such a way that it would always be perfectly consistent with the way these people had acted before. And I used incidents that did really happen to sort of bolster those things. So I think it's as real as it possibly could be for a person who wasn't actually there. Yeah. That was a very long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Along those same lines and without getting into a writer's workshop tonight, <laughs> I think, well, so, so as far as like when you're, when you're writing dialogue, I find that um, this is where my, my acting past comes in, and, and I say that so loosely, like high school, um, but you know, I have, that I have a very um, creative actress daughter, and you know, and so that's very much kind of, you know, like one of my skill set things, and I think it really helps to almost as you're writing to pretend like you're on stage and like you are that person and what would come out of their mouth. In, in this instance, I was so lucky to have those oral histories. I could hear their voices. I could see their mannerisms. I could get a sense of their sense of humor, the turn of phrase. Um, I tried to make sure that everything in the book had a more Polish sentence structure not a British one. I tend to go Britishy, you know. So, so I I try to cut every single bit of that out and make sure that syntax and structure um, are the way someone who is Polish but speaking English would turn that phrase, you know. So, so things like that I try to be really careful about for accuracy. Um, but I think it's it's a it's a listening thing for writing that dialogue. Now, do you get it right the first time? No, of course not. Um, you get it wrong a lot. So that is where my critique group comes in. They read everything that I do first, um, and they don't let me get away with anything. So if they think it's wrong, or they're bored, or I did something badly, they will tell me in no uncertain terms that, that that is the way that is. But it's also what I depend on my editor for um, we had um, other readers 
in this case, um, we had someone from Yad Vashem read the book um, that was a Holocaust um, teacher at a university in Israel. We had um, a Polish um, historian read the book. Um, so we, we, went, we tried to make sure that we were getting things as, as accurate as possible. Yes, um, absolutely. And that is why uh, the name Max Diamant got changed to Joseph Bersminski. Um, even after the war um, in Shemesh, there, before the war, um, I'm gonna, I think I'm getting my numbers right, I think I'm gonna remember this correctly. Before the war, there were about 50,000 Jews in Shemesh. Um, the, the population of the city was about half and half with a little bit of Greek Orthodox thrown in as well. But basically half Catholic, half Jewish. At the end of the war, about 250 survivors from the Jewish community. Almost completely wiped out. And yes, there were absolutely people present in the city who were ready to finish the work that Hitler had started. That felt like job not completely done. Um, so, and I have to say, in Shemesh is a small town. Even when I was there with Ed researching, we were very careful. In, in the archives, we did not tell them we were researching Jewish names. We did not tell them we were looking for Jewish addresses. We were careful who we told because they might not help us. And that's just the way the way it still is, not with everyone. We also met with a school teacher there who's been teaching Stefania's story in her classroom for years now. Um, she's absolutely been just incredible at trying to get this message out in her city. Um, but yeah, there's still that element there. And after the war, um, things were very difficult. And there was a time where they did come after Max and broke down the door and he had to climb off a balcony to get away. And, you know, so they did end up um, immigrating, you know, first to Israel and then to the United States. Anybody else have any other questions for our author? She is going to take the last 30 minutes here and sign your book. We're yes. selling books as well. And we have cookie cakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, book cookies. <laughs> I did love them. She sent me a picture last night. I was amazed. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm happy to answer if there are. Well, thank you. So, oh, was there? Did I miss? Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it.